Hello. Really, really excited to be chairing, uh, to emceeing the session. Um, a topic really close to my heart, which is carbon neutral and carbon positive housing. And really excited to hear from these homeowners today and, um, and, and project participants. Um, I would like to mention the sponsor, Bank Australia. Very grateful for them for um, assisting with putting on this session today. Um, also, I really want to make sure that we do get the most out of this session. Please post all your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, please also use the chat. I'd love to also see where you're joining from. It's really exciting to see over 500 people in this session right now. Um, so yeah, please, please chat away with each other. Please participate by using the Q&A as well. Um, I won't be looking in the chat for questions, so yeah, Q&A please. Uh, as mentioned a couple of times today, if you uh, like what you see in this uh, Sustainable Open House Day, please also consider donating um, and support the organisation who's putting this on. So without further ado, I'd like to, make, I'd like to jump in. Um, so today we're joined by uh, four different uh, project teams. Uh, we have John and Trudy Haynes from Hillside House, uh, Paul Hendy from Piano House, Jasmine Sesso from Cheese House, and Tim Adams for the House with No Bills. Um, so uh, it'd be great if we could hear an intro from each of you in turn. We might start with John and Trudy uh, to hear about a little bit about Hillside House. Uh, good day. We're John and Trudy from um, Hillside House in the outer eastern suburbs of Melbourne. Uh, prior to building Hillside House in 2017, we lived in a, a large rambling uh, timber house on five acres out in the Yarra Valley. It was on a southern slope and it had huge, beautiful trees around it. So we didn't have a lot of sun into the building, so to speak. Our first quest was to, uh, following our decision to downsize, was to find a suburban block that um, sort of suited our, our dream of building a sustainable house. And the main thing was to use some of the great materials that have become available for building in the last um, uh, probably 20 years. Uh, just some fantastic materials now. After a fairly intensive um, uh, looking period, we finally found a, a property uh, on two thirds of an acre in Croydon North. The property was relatively steep, and even at one point, we even considered embedding the house into the side of the hill. But we, we did move away from that in the end. A lot, of, a lot of issues associated with that, and we decided not to go that way. Um, the key to this house is that it's well designed and well built, and um, it uh, minimizes heating, lighting, and cooling. And it's got an 8.1 star rating. Um, it's beautiful to live in, the temperature is always moderate, and the house is backed up with a um, 4.8 kilowatt system and uh, with a 10 kilowatt storage battery. And that provides certainly the two of us with all the power that we need. Um, we haven't radically changed the way we live, um, like everybody else. We use dishwashers and uh, um, washing machines and everything else. We're careful with how we use them, and we use them when the sun's shining particularly, which reduces your cost as well. And uh, we've come over the last two years living here very close to being a carbon neutral um, environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up, I'd like to hear the intro from Paul for Piano House. You're possibly on mute if you are talking. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, an interesting product, a project. A client came in from, uh, from off the street, basically, and walked into the office with a very poorly orientated site. Uh, it was just about as bad as you could get. Infill, quite small, 400 metres, and um, asked what we could do. So I sort of looked at it and just drew a couple of boxes that were random on there. And um, he said, can you do that? I said, well, yes, I don't see why we shouldn't do And we, they were drawn facing north. And basically, he came back a few days later and said, right, I'd like to go ahead with this. So uh, he signed up and we started then to design. And the two boxes, now if you look at the plan, they're still there. The, the original form is still there facing north. Um, and what it's created is a house which is 8.1 star rated, which is a, a very good for the, the orientation. And considering there's absolutely no shade whatsoever on that house, uh, it's, it's very, very contemporary. Um, in an area which is um, a heritage area. It was embraced by the council because it was low energy. 
and because we were using local materials where we could do and um, because we were actually you know, promoting a, a positive carbon footprint as opposed to actually you know, creating carbon through the operational cycle of the house. So the client's very happy. He's, uh, he's been there for the best part of a year now and he has uh, his energy bills about uh, a tenth of what he had, I understand, from the previous house. So he's very happy. He's got uh, hot water for free, basically, of the PV system that he's got, the solar system. Um, he's decorated it really well. I mean, it's a, it's a lovely house, but um, I'm biased anyway. But he, the, the clients really like it. They're, they're very impressed with the, the sort of performance. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Um, next up, we've got Jasmine from the Cheese House. Or Cheese House. I shouldn't say the Cheese House. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hello, I'm Jasmine and this is James. Um, we, uh, so about 10 years ago, we bought an old Edwardian, a single fronted Edwardian in Coburg and it was kind of the, the worst house on the best street, I think. So we always had every intention of fixing it up um, and we'd been living in it for about four years. It was perfectly serviceable but really inefficient. Um, really drafty, lots of gaps in the windows, um, gaps in the floors, um, no insulation, so hot in summer, really cold in winter, and dusty. We found it got really dusty. Um, so yeah, about six years ago, or nearly seven years ago now, we embarked on um, the journey to, to find someone to um, design a renovation and to build with us. Um, during that, so we did a lot of research in the lead up. Um, I interviewed a number of architects and um, drafts people and we actually had a bit of a misfire when we started out. So we ended up engaging um, somebody that we didn't, that came up with a design, but we weren't really um, happy with it, with how it all went. So we, we had an amicable breakup um, and we looked for somebody else and we came across the team at Positive Footprints. Um, the way that we did that was um, I'd been following a blog um, from an author and, or a contributor to Sanctuary Magazine. And I sort of went back through her, her blog archives and found out who her designer was because it, her whole experience was so positive um, and certainly the build that she undertook was similar to what we were looking at doing. Um, so we reached out to the team at Positive Footprints. They were amazing from the beginning. Um, we've had a, a seamless experience with them. So they designed our home and then went on to build it. Um, we, uh, we relied really heavily on their expertise um, and we trusted in their knowledge um, and they guided us through the whole process. It was fantastic. So in the end, we've come up with a 7.9 star efficient home, which um, is carbon positive in summer. We do draw from the grid in winter, um, but year throughout it, it ends up being almost neutral. Um, we, uh, we've got a 4.7 kilowatt um, solar, system, solar panel system on the, the roof. Um, where uh, our block is north-south orientation, so our, um, our PV is east-west. Um, so it's fantastic, actually. We, we track the gain throughout the day. We try to run any intensive appliances when we're getting the most solar gain. So we've been really fortunate um, any, any of the appliances that we've had to replace during the renovation. And, and since we've lived here, we've tried to get um, the most efficient model that we could afford. But we try and do things like run the dishwasher or the washing machine by day um, and then hang things out overnight and, and so on and so forth. Um, and we're really lucky that we're able to do that. Um, we've got two heat pumps, um, one that services the potable water and one that services the hydronic heating. Um, so we use hydronic heating throughout the, the cooler months um, and then we use the inverters, the split systems throughout the warmer months just to cool the house down. We're upstairs at the moment um, and we find that upstairs generally runs about two to three degrees warmer than downstairs uh, relatively consistently. Um, it's really comfortable but what it means is that we just set the, the hydronic panels on the lower setting by day up here um, and because no one's sleeping up here at the moment overnight we can run them at the lower setting throughout. Um, but the whole house has a really beautiful temperate feel. Um, we don't have um, big, uh, big drops or, or increases in temperature generally. Um, we love the space, it's really flexible. We've got two rooms, two bedrooms up, two bedrooms down. Currently we're using the two bedrooms upstairs as offices. Um, we're in Melbourne so we, um, we're at home all the time at the moment. Um, but eventually, so we built for our future really and eventually we anticipate that the children will move up here and, and they'll use this space as their, as their own, I think. So I think that's it, about it for us. We'll have Great. Enjoy. Thank you. Yeah, breaking up with your architects. I've done it. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, next up, uh, we've got Tim Adams um, from the House of No Bills. I'd love to live, hear a little bit about that. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, the virtual event um, that occurred is occurring this year has provided us the ability to share the experience of living in a house with no bills for 11 years. Um, it got that name um, as a cover story in Renew 21. So if anyone wants to look at that story, you can go to the back copies. Um, 
it was designed as a forever house um, and it was cr critical that it would be comfortable, joyful, um, uh, but at a, at a minimum cost um, so that we could deliver zero running costs and also be environmentally respectful. Um, the clear goal was to prove that high performance results are de delivered by careful design um, need not be um, expensive um, and, and you don't need to solve uh, problems with expensive specifications. Um, premium passive solar performance through large areas of north glass, which are shaded in summer, um, and slab on ground has resulted in a modest heating energy demand. Um, I weighed every stick of timber that we brought into the house um, in 2016, um, and it was 1,426 kilograms. Um, and that was enough to heat all the house and all the hot water um, in addition to the uh, 60 evacuated tubes that we've got on the roof. Um, the proof of concept has been experienced. Um, we can wear t-shirts and shorts on cold sunny winter days uh, when in the afternoon it gets up to 25 degrees inside the house. Um, plus it's now been proved with the Victorian residential efficient energy efficiency scorecard um, and it rates at 10 stars in that metric. Um, which is basically what we wanted to do. Um, that metric wasn't available at the time, but uh, um, it's now shown that uh, we've actually achieved what we set out to do. Um, and the scorecard looks at the a balance of the building fabric thermal performance with the efficiency of, of all the major appliances for heating, cooling and hot water. Um, some things that we would do differently today um, have occurred because of um, advances in technology um, and the cost of those things. So this design was, was conceived over 13 years ago now um, and we paid four and a half thousand dollars, uh, sorry, we paid thirteen and a half thousand dollars for a three kilowatt system and you could get the same system now for about four and a half thousand dollars. So those things, you need to keep abreast of those sorts of changes. Um, and make um, appropriate decisions. Um, the F squared design catchphrase is, um, it is knowledge that makes a difference, not money. Um, and sustainable house day uh, provides us with a wonderful opportunity to, to spread that knowledge as widely as possible. So thanks for making this event possible. Thank you, Tim. Um, and yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I've been just watching people uh, note where they're watching in from in the chat and it's, it's amazing to see. It's, 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 in, it's national. So it's, it's really great. Um, so I'll just remind everyone who's watching to pop your questions in the Q&A, uh, not in the chat. Um, so far, I can't see any, but that's great because it means I get to ask mine. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start with one that I'd like everyone to sort of um, contribute to. Uh, I'm not sure how to do this. I might do hands or something. Um, but my first question is, uh, in your journey to carbon neutral or carbon positive, um, or I guess as, as you set out on the journey, was carbon neutral or carbon positive your objective? Or is it something that you found, you found on your journey? Or is it something that you found as you've, as you've lived in it? You know, um, was this a key outcome or is it some, something you've gotten to? Tim, from you first, perhaps. Uh, yeah, it, it was absolutely a, a, an imperative for us. Um, taking a, a property which was, had been a sheep paddock um, and making sure that what we did on the land was, was responsible, but also to experience what all that meant so that I could put that into practice in, in my day job. Um, and, and we knew that uh, we would have the opportunity to uh, generate, as it's turned out, about 125% um, of the electricity that we use on site. So, We'd, we'd uh, overcome that problem of not needing to uh, use any um, electricity that came from a fossil fuel source. Um, but also we, we've um, planted a thousand trees that we got from land care um, and that um, is sequestering way more um, carbon on site than we would ever um, put out by, by burning that small amount of timber that I indicated before. It's important if you do burn timber that it's done in a high performance um, uh, appliance um, that you get the, the heat energy of the timber into the house or into the water. Um, but yes, it was it was really important that we um, were confident that we had a had a basically a carbon positive occupation of this site. It'll be different for people in different locations, 
um, different solutions for an urban setting, but it's but the lessons learned make it that sort of thing, um, the, the understanding possible. Fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, I might go to Paul next, yeah. Hi. I'll on mute this time, it might work a little bit better. <laughs> um, we, um, I guess ever since designing Australia's first um, zero carbon house, we that became a sort of an underlying uh, element of practice. And really what we've found now is that the way we design, the wall systems we use, the thermal insulation, the double glazing, all the elements that come together, um, that's not, you know, obviously to rule out the passive elements, the orientation of the building, the airflow, natural airflow through it as well, um, the light, everything that we can generate, um, that's something which now we just, we just do as a normal. Um, so basically all our homes are, are carbon positive. So it should be it depends on the lifestyle of the client obviously and of the individual but typically nowadays if you've got a well-performing home it's not that difficult to export more energy than you use I know that my own house is a, a house that's a 8.4 star that's a turn of the century um double fronted cottage here and you know with a modern extension on the back of it and that that's that's um we actually export more than we use and we're here quite a lot during the day so it would be even better if we we were actually going to to work somewhere you know, actually leaving the premises. So it's, it's something which I think um, really if, if the, you know, the, the quality of housing was better overall, it would actually not be that difficult to do. We'll certainly get very close to it. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that would agree with that, um, myself included. Um, John and Trudy, yeah, I might go to you next. Yes, I, I think our experience initially was you're not quite certain if you're going to get that far or not to actually get to a, a carbon neutral situation. Um, I think overall the system has surprised us. And um, I think the addition of the battery in our case uh, has made a huge difference. I mean, when you, uh, when you run the entire night without having to draw any power from the grid, you, you know you're going to be ahead of the game. And every day, particularly on sunny days, um, your um, you're producing a lot more power than you're putting into that battery and, and you're running your appliances. You make sure all your appliances are um, good quality um, appliances at last. And basically you have to do your homework on everything you, you, you go into to, to see um, uh, how effective it's gonna be in your situation. Um, the sustainable house that we've got here, it, it is more than impressed me, particularly during the winter. I mean. Uh, we just use very little heat, um, as a number of people have mentioned, um, but we've got a great northerly aspect too. I think in some cases, um, people might not be as successful, but you can certainly get there, I think, if you, um, uh, you're, you're careful with your choices and how you use um, your appliances and, um, and you know, how you design your house. That's great to hear from both of you, actually. Um... Jasmine and James, uh, I might go to you next. Thanks, Claire. Um, so I think when we when we bought the property, um, we were probably a bit naive to um, the benefits of, of solar gain um, and the benefits of good orientation, I think. So we, we're on a single fronted block, as I said, it faces south, so our rear faces north. Um, so when we when we started to talk about the build and when we explored the design with um, Jeremy and Chief Positive Footprints, um, we were, we were conscious that we might not get um, to, to be a positive, a carbon positive home. However, um, I think with, with all of the investment that we've made in, in insulation, with retrofitting insulation and replacing the windows in the original part of the house, and then in the new part of the house, it's, it's just beautiful. It's, it's built so tight. We've got the face change material underneath all of the walls. We use reverse brick veneer on the east side. Um, and we've got the ceramic tiles on top of the waffle slab. So all of these small investments really have created a, a fantastic home that runs incredibly efficiently. And I think for, for the orientation that we have, um, considering the, the shadowing restrictions that we had as part of the design and um, the, the limited frontage, um, I think we've achieved an exceptional result with 7.9 stars. And certainly I don't feel that we're terribly modest in our energy consumption either. We're a, we're a family with young children and at the moment we're home all the time working from home and the children are home. They've been home since March. So we've got a number of devices and computers and bits and pieces. I cook a lot. Um, we're all electric, so I cook a lot on induction. Um, and still we've managed to achieve such an incredible result with our power consumption. And I think that um, that's all through 
um, thoughtful design and thoughtful um, investment in, in sustainable features because I don't think that we're terribly, um, we don't invest very heavily in, in being efficient by day, to be honest. Um, so I think that, yeah, we've achieved an incredible result. Fantastic. Um, and actually, I need to introduce your architect, Jeremy, from Positive Footprints, who's actually joined us on the panel. I'm sorry, I could only see a certain number of little people on my screen and I, and I missed him. Welcome, Jeremy. Um, and I was wondering, uh, <laughs> I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the process in, um, you know, in designing this house to be, uh, you know, as great as it is. Okay, so um, yes, I'm here to support obviously James and Jasmine from Cheese House, but also John and Trudy. We did their house, uh, Hillside House. Hi, John and Trudy. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I truly believe that the industry is just behind in, in knowing just how easy it is to get to carbon neutral and beyond. Um, really, over the last 10 years, the, the technology, uh, as Paul, from, uh, Paul was saying, uh, the, the, the technology has, has improved just when we need it uh, and the price points have come down uh, so that there is really no reason why this can't go mainstream uh, and, and quite quickly. And if I was building today, um, you know, I, I would definitely be including this because 10, 15 years time, you might find that your, your home is, is now uh, not a modern home anymore. And uh, if you're trying to sell it, you'll, you'll be behind the curve trying to sell it or you'll be facing, you know, an expensive renovation. So anyway, that's just my thoughts. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Um, and it was, it's really interesting to hear that, um, in, you know, at least a number of you are, are all electric. Um, and one of the questions we've got is how hard and or expensive is it to replace a gas boiler for hydronic heating with heat pump? Um, or any other type of heating actually, I guess it doesn't have to be hydronic. Um, because a lot of people would love to ditch gas and that, you know, uh, are there any, are there any tips or, you know, ex, you know, experiences with that? Um, well, we can, we can talk to that a little bit. So we, um, we was, were previously reliant on gas in our, in the original house. Um, and that was one of the, the briefs that we gave our, um, our team was that we wanted to go fully electric. And it was interesting because at the time I remember generally saying, Oh, but it, electricity in Victoria is it such a, it relies on, brown coal, um, it's not a very, it's not a great, it's not a very clean power. We said, oh, but it's not renewable. Gas isn't renewable. We don't want to invest in it. Um, and so we actually explored a number of different boilers. So we talked to the team at Sandin about um, people buying the Sandin heat pumps and um, modifying them to service a, um, the hydronic heating. And they were really opposed to it, the whole thing. They said that it voids the warranty, that it didn't perform well. It performed well for a very small percentage of their customers. So we ended up getting a, um, a Bosch uh, boiler for the for the, the hydronics. It was not terribly cheap, um, and nor is it as efficient as some of the other models. I think that we've come a long way since we did our build, um, but totally worth the investment. As I said, um, we're only drawing a limited amount of power from the grid in winter, even though that's servicing um, the the hydronics throughout the whole house as well as our potable water. Um, so. I've, Certainly not a cheap exercise. I think it's cheaper now than it was, you know, five or six years ago when we originally invested in it. But um, yeah, it, it's it's paid off in spades, I think. Excellent, thank you. Uh, just wondering if anyone else has any tips, or um, we've actually also got a question about um, for Tim asking if he could elaborate on a high performance wood burner or a high efficiency wood burner. Okay, well I can I can do that, and uh, just on replacing. Um, um, gas hydronic with electric hydronic, um, it's, um, you need to look at the performance of the house before you do that. So with uh, Jasmine and James, um, it's worked pretty well there probably because the house actually doesn't need too much heating anyway. Um, if, it's, if it's a house that doesn't, uh, wasn't designed with such good um, passive performance, then yeah, you might need quite a lot of electricity to run the, the heat pump hydronic. And unfortunately, it happens at the time of the year when we've got at least um, available sun to generate your own electricity on site. So um, careful balancing needs to be to be done there and you need to talk to somebody who can do those calculations, I think, for it to, to be a successful solution. Um, on the question of the um, high performance wood heaters, yes, anything that you buy today um, has to comply with current Australian standards, which were raised a, a while ago. And it means that um, the efficiency of turning the wood into useful energy in the house um, will be at around 70% or uh, and sometimes more. So when you're looking to buy an appliance, you need to look at the 
the data that's available for that that efficiency. Uh, the unit that we um, have here is the Battalion um, Boiler. Um, brand is FAMAR, F-A-M-I-R, um, and it's got an efficiency of around that 75% um, to turn the, the um, wood um, burned heat into um, the hot water. It actually sits in the living room and we do get some case emission off the unit and off the flue to add to um, the benefit in the room, but the um, core um, technology that's being used there is to use the, the wood fired or heat water that then runs into the storage tank for both domestic use and for hydronic heating in the floor. Um, we don't actually run it through the coils in the floor very often because the, the house works so well from a passive point of view. So that's a, that's a bit of a dilemma that people need to have a look at and consider as well where, where the capital cost of an installation um, might in fact be um, something that isn't needed down the track if the house is working really well. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually have a question around uh, measuring whether the home is carbon neutral or carbon positive. Um, and I guess probably that's one thing it would be really interesting for us to uh, define a little bit better. We are talking, most of us are talking about operational energy um, uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, net, the net carbon emissions from running our homes across the year. But we do have a, a question. Uh, is there an easy way to count the embedded carbon of the construction and appliances? And, you know, ha has anyone gone through the exercise of figuring out over the lifespan or the anticipated lifespan of your building? Where, where you might land, particularly with the data that you've got to date. Jeremy, I'll go to you first. Uh, so the, the, the general rule of thumb that CSIRO came up with was that the embodied energy of the home is, is equivalent to around about 15 years of the operational energy in a standard home. That sort of places a, a relative importance. Though recent, um, recent looking at, at, at that has sort of pushed it out that it might even be more important than that. And especially as we're starting to become more efficient at what we do, the embodied energy becomes even, even more relative to the operational energy if, if, if that's going down. Uh, I should just let people know there's a free database that's just come out called the EPIC database developed by um, Melbourne University over the last four years and, and that ranks uh, building materials and uh, so it gives you apples to apples comparison of different building materials. Uh, anyone can download it and you can work out and, and do like a ballpark um, uh, embodied energy um, calculation on, on any design that you're doing. And it's really good because you can straight away see, well, you know, should I, if someone mentioned um, concrete and, and how much embodied energy is, is in that, you know, what's my performance payoff like in, in stars, how, how much my operational energy going up? by putting in a slab or, or a rammed earth wall or, or brick wall versus how much embodied energy is in that. And um, so, yeah, it's a, a useful tool. And definitely to go to true zero, which is where we should all be aiming at. Operational is great, um, but operational is actually the low bar. And the next thing we should be striving for is to include the embodied energy in those calculations. Hello. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I did the whole mute thing myself. It was bound to happen eventually. Um, <laughs> Paul, I'd love to hear from you next. Look, I can't comment on the, uh, the piano house, but I can comment on the zero carbon house, which will put it into perspective, uh, hopefully. Um, there are two sides, as Jeremy was saying. You, you've got the operational side, which is actually a relatively easy bar to hit these days. And as Jeremy's already said, with the, the technology that's coming out, the fall in price of, of generating electricity on site, it really isn't that hard to do. And we, we, it's something we sh every house should be doing. Um, I keep saying five years, and I've been in practice for getting on for 15 years now. And it'll be another five years, I think, but I think we'll be a lot closer in five years' time. The construction, the actual embodied energy, is much harder to quantify. Um, and with the zero carbon house, that was that only had a 3.2 kilowatt system at the time, because we're going back about uh, seven, eight years. And as it's being said before, the price has fallen quite significantly with that sort of technology. Um, we were zero, we were basically hit zero carbon for both embodied and operational. And from that point on, we had payback. Um, so we were then, we were basically a zero carbon house uh, in 32 years. Now, if you apply a bigger PV system in there, or conversely, go and plant a couple of thousand trees, which I think is always a bit of a, a, you know, sort of a cheat way of doing it. But if you turn around and, and actually put a bigger system on there, then you'll actually pay that, that you'll be able to put back into the grid 
um, more energy than you're using, so you can actually pay back the original operational and also the, the body energy quicker. But it is, it's very difficult to calculate. Um, it, there's no real structure at the moment that was going to be put in place. But even for the zero carbon house, we had to fudge it with government um, and, and sort of with agencies that have come up to try to get that. And we, we were logging everything from car miles as well. So, you know, people, the, the trades coming from different distances and, and everything to build that house. So it's not just a piece of cement or a piece of timber. Thank you both. That's, um, yeah, carbon accounting is something I've done a fair bit of and the data, sourcing data, yeah, the biggest headache, absolutely. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit from the homeowners on two fronts, actually. We've had two questions. Um, one being around uh, added cost, I guess, and everyone always wants to know how much extra did this cost? How much did this fab fabulous idea add to your budget? Um, and the second question, which I guess is, is really closely related to that is, um, did, was there anything you did to assist in that process, like helping to source materials, um, participating in you know, the project in different ways? I might start with um, John and Trudy, if, you're, if you've got an answer for that. Yep, go ahead. Look, um, our, ours is estimated in the vicinity of 30,000. It probably goes a little bit more. Um, in terms of sourcing particular things, we did a lot of the sourcing of um, products that we put into this house. Um, but Jeremy also and his team at um, uh, positive footprints, um, they also helped us on that front uh, with suggestions and so forth. I think um, that it's um, in, in the, this carbon neutral discussion is, is really quite interesting because the, the building them, themselves, I just can't see how we're going to get around that in the future. But in the long term, this is the only way um, I think we can go in terms of reducing the overall carbon input. And um, gentleman there mentioned planting trees. I mean, I've spent um, many years now planting trees and properties that I've been in and uh, including this one, which is much smaller than the last one. And they are important components to reducing the, the overall footprint. So um, I think the material question is suited to everybody's particular needs and what sort of lifestyle they lead and, and where, where, where they are, are leading it as well. So, uh, that's basically all I've got on that front. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Jasmine and James. Um, so I, I couldn't, I don't have a dollar cost actually. I think um, Jeremy and she estimated the, the investment in um, sustainable features to be between 20 and $30,000 for the, for the entire build. But throughout like we, um, so we had a budget obviously that we went to the team with and, and then we went back and forth and negotiated that and throughout the build, um, actually Jeremy came in under budget. He's incredible. Um, it was amazing. But, you know, we did have to make trade-offs based on what we could afford as well. Um, so for instance, we would we really wanted um, concrete concrete floors downstairs where we could maximise the solar gain. So we've got the, the waffle slab and we wanted polished concrete floors um, but uh, even so the, the composite concrete, which was probably the most um, or had the least environmental impact was really, really costly. So we had to weigh it up and we looked, we ended up going with ceramic tiles because it had a similar performance. I think it's a negligible um, uh, difference in, in performance. Um, so we still capitalize on that solar gain, but it came in at a much um, lesser cost. Um, so I think that, you know, there were definitely, there was definitely negotiating and we looked at, you know, originally we were looking to have um, brick veneer, um, reverse brick mini throughout the whole downstairs area. Um, but that was just too costly, um, mostly in labor. Um, and so we ended up just investing, we said to Jeremy, if we just had to invest in, in part of that, like what would we invest in? So we went with the east facing wall. So I think it's really important. Uh, well, our message is it's just so important to have a really good relationship with your builders and your architects where you can actually find that happy medium based on, you know, what, what gives you the best bang for your buck. Um, and let them trust that they're the experts, trust that they know, and they'll be able to guide you through that process because, so James and I weren't involved in the build at all. We both work in IT um, and we just trusted the team would do the best possible job for us <laughs> and they did. That's great, thank you very much. Um, I actually work in construction and I also still decided that it's best for me to just get out of the way when even I was doing my own house. So uh, smart decision. Um, we are unfortunately running pretty close to time, but I would like to get a little bit of a, a last grab from each of you. Um, and it's, it's actually a question that's come through from a couple of our, uh, our guests. 
Um, what is your top tip to get started and or um, what is the one thing with time and hindsight you would recommend to people on this journey? Uh, I might start with Paul. Top tip, um, obviously a good designer. So you need a good designer. I would suggest you need a good designer. Um, there are a lot of companies that I've come across that, that certainly say they can do and then you end up with a very typical home. But you also need a good builder. You can't do one without the other. It's great having the best design in the world, but if it's not built properly, it's just never going to perform. So it, it really is a combination. It's a team effort of both. We only work with two builders. We don't, we don't work with anybody else. And that's how we've got around that problem because um, trades, there's a, there's a huge, um, a huge hill to climb when it comes to education of, in the construction interest industry, which is not renowned for its speed of moving forwards. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, Tim. Uh, yeah, spend time at the design stage. Um, get get those things right. Um, respect your site. Understand the the um, microclimates that you can create around a house, as well as the overriding um, environment that you're building into. Get those things right and test them. The the NetHers um, uh, rating system is predominantly still used as a compliance tool at the end of the day that, that so many designers and builders just say, oh, oh we've got to get a, a building permit. We need to get a NATO's rating. The NATO's tool is just incredibly powerful. It, it measures the heat, uh, the temperature in each room of the house for every hour of the year and gives you room by room um, analysis. And you can use that to target solutions for every room of the house at a very simple level. So. Um, yeah, if you're engaging with a designer or an architect um, or a builder, um, get, make sure that they are switched on to use matters as a, an aid to making design decisions, not just as, com as a compliance tool. And yeah. if, you do, if you do that, you'll be able to do this sort of stuff um, at very, very reasonable cost levels. I, uh, the question you had before, Claire, um, I'd suggest that the, the, there's basically no cost premium for the house with no build. Um, you know, we built a 190 square meter house, a garage and a studio, both 80 odd square meters um, for $400,000. So it, it would be more now, a little bit more, but um, yeah, it, um, it, was, it was very cost efficient at the time as well, because I didn't want to spend a lot of money. That's exciting. And it's been really, really exciting to hear that, um, you know, I think the two messages out of this is it shouldn't cost that much more, if anything, um, and that, uh, it's not that hard, which is also an exciting message to have. Um, John and Trudy and Jasmine and James, I just might very quickly get um, perhaps a, a trick for new players from you both. Okay, I, I think probably um, they've already been mentioned. I mean, uh, one of the aspects we actually found out previously from uh, going to Sustainable House Day was that Architects seem to be easy to find, but the builders that can build sustainable houses were not so easy to find, at least where we were. So we were very fortunate with Jeremy and his team because they designed the place and they built it, which put a, they were invested more into it as well, which I thought was a really, really good thing. And we were very happy with the process all the way through. So uh, the key tip is to try to link to two if you can whether it's um, somebody that designs with a preferred builder or whatever. But if you can link those two, I, I think that's, um, that's a top tip if you're, you're starting from the beginning of the process. Great, thank you. Jasmine. Yeah, so I mean, we'll, we echo what um, John and Trudy and what Paul said as well. Um, research, 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 invest heavily, as heavily as you can in research and find a team that you trust, find a designer that you trust and find a builder that you trust. Um, because it just makes the whole process much easier. We would, we would embark on, on a renovation or a build with um, the team at Positive Footprints again tomorrow if we had an opportunity. They're just fantastic. We were not burned in the process <laughs> at all. Excellent. Well, Jeremy, I, I might, I'm not even going to ask you because you've just had two massive plugs there. <laughs> um, thank you all. It's been fa a fantastic discussion and I hope you've inspired a lot, a lot of our, um, our audience on uh, proceeding through with their dreams for carbon neutral and carbon positive housing. Thank you very much.